And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome to Open Connection, your host, Robert Picto. Our show today comes to you from the traditional and unceded territory of the Simshan people. Aquatic weeds come in many forms, including submerged, floating, and emergent species. And each plant species reproduces differently, some by transportation of seeds from one location to another, and others via fragmentation, which becomes a piece of vegetation breaks off and forms a completely new plant. On today's Open Connection, we open our archives to bring you this story from 2000. Ian Maxwell is one of the people who spotted what turns out to be Elodia canadensis in several spots around Lacalle's Lake last year. He lives not far from the Furlong Bay campground and boat launch, where this patch was already a large tangled mass early this spring. And this is the same weed that has infested uh, uh, Tai Lake and Lake Kathleen and a number of other lakes. Uh, and it can get extremely thick, so it's quite a concern. A number of long-time Lacalle's residents say this plant has shown up just in the past two years. Environment Ministry staff recommended they form a committee and do a survey. We have divided the lake into nine sections and each of us has picked a section and before the end of May we're going to try and put dots on the map as to where the, le the weed is and where it isn't. Since spring, about a dozen Lacalle's Lake residents have been documenting the spread of Elodia with surveys once a month. Several times, provincial government staff have come out to help. My first impression was that <clears throat> Lake Else is different enough that uh, it has enough flow through it that it really wouldn't be a problem here. But we're finding um, as the season progresses this year that it's uh, growing more and more, certainly beyond our expectation. On this day in August, BC Park staff also lent a hand and the use of a boat. Well, our main interest in this Theolodia is similar to that to most of the property owners along the lake and that we have a, a lot of waterfront in our parks and a lot of people come down to our beaches for the day in the, in the summer. And uh, this is one of the few lakes around this area that people can go to. And on a hot sunny day, we can get 500, 600 people down on our beaches and they're coming to swim. And that swimming is no longer as pleasant. A lot of it is just the weeds make swimming yucky. That's the main thing you hear, that the kids don't like to swim in it because it does get tangled in their legs. At the Furlong Bay boat launch and private docks around the lake, thick forests of Elodia are also tangling up boat propellers. And this is what Lacalse residents fear their weed problem could turn into. People around Lake Kathleen near Smithers have made great strides in restoring their lake to a usable body of water for recreation. But it's taken hours of strenuous work, money, organization and constant vigilance. At Lake Kathleen, Taiyi and other lakes, Elodia seems to grow in cycles. Several years of rapid growth followed by a die-off. That might help explain discrepancies among past studies and residents' memories at Lakels Lake. A government study at Lake Hells in the 1970s reported Elodia in several spots, but another from the mid-1980s found no Elodia. This survey will produce yet more documentation. This is an underwater camera and it's hooked to uh, a, a small Sony Handycam. Um, we put a weight on it, an old chunk of pipe, so that it remains oriented like this in the water as we troll along. Um, it has two little lights on it that uh, help you see in deeper water and they're just battery operated. And, and so what you do is you just lower it down in like that and then we're using a depth sounder uh, right over there to help us figure out how close to the bottom we want to put this thing. So if we're in 10 feet of water, what I want to do is lower this down about eight feet. And Gordon's looking at the handy cam and he's telling me how close I am to the bottom. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Thank you for staying with us. Submerged weeds grow from the bottom of the water body and sometimes top out on the surface. While they don't always create visual distractions, submerged weeds clog water intake systems, increase flooding risks, endanger swimmers, and disturb the natural predator-prey relationships in an aquatic ecosystem. Let us return to the archives with Ian Sharp. 
And we just went through a patch here where we had a, a whole, well, probably four or five different species of uh, aquatic plants. And then we came to a little zone where it was all of this one weed, Elodia. And it was very narrow band. I don't know, might've been 10 or 15 feet wide or so. And uh, then we went back into the other uh, weed band as well that was, you know, more in a natural condition. I was quite surprised to see that uh, the Elodia out just in that one narrow band like that. So that's the kind of stuff we're learning by trolling along here with this camera and the depth sounder. One factor that could encourage the Elodia growth is a change in the chemistry of lake water. And that's why volunteers are sampling it. Okay, so what we have is a hollow tube with caps on both ends. We lower this down to the uh, depth that we want to sample the water at, and then this, and then we release this weight, and the weight goes down and, and, and traps the water inside. And then we pull this up, take the water out, and put it into this sample bucket here. And then what we're doing is we're measuring conductivity on this meter and we're measuring pH on that one and we're measuring dissolved oxygen on that one. If they find an increase in nutrient levels in the lake, the next question is where might it be coming from? Suspects could include septic systems, fertilizers and even natural sources. Plus there's the question of climate change. If septic seepage is an issue, the Kitimat Stikine Regional District may be in a better position to deal with that in a couple of years. It's seeking funds to plan for liquid waste management in the area. I think everybody that's involved is aware that we can't continue indefinitely without some kind of a system. And that includes uh, uh, Jack Pine because their area drains into Williams Creek and Williams Creek into the lake. and. So we're all in the, in the watershed. Bob Cooper lives at the lake himself, and Elodia is encroaching on his beach too. If money is required to battle it, the regional district has one way to help. Uh, I think the only way we can do it would be under a bylaw on a specified area, so that the people around the lake were involved. And um, I would imagine under something like that, there would also be other grants from, or whatever, you know, whatever required, because uh, Clark is really a, you know, involved with the picnic site and the campsite and, and, um, and of course, fisheries itself and the environment. The last survey of Elodia this season was this week. Over the winter, stakeholders will be drawing up action plans for next spring, and they may get some additional expert advice. I'm hoping to see if I can organize a, a mini symposium somewhere here in this region, and maybe we can get a couple of people in from places where They've had a long experience with this weed and we'll learn uh, some more about what we might do and whether or not nature should just take its course or whether we should intervene. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome back to Open Connection. Although speeders have a top speed of only about 30 miles per hour, they are so nicknamed because compared to the manually powered pump cars they replace, they are much faster. Let us return to the archives with some collectors of speeders. Yep, that's it. BC's Northwest is renowned for its vast scenery, and each year scores of tourists pass between the mountains and over the streams and rivers. But this is not the way most see the countryside. These are Fairmont motor cars or speeders, and they traveled from Prince George to Prince Rupert this summer, welcomed in Smithers with musical performances, and by spectators, train enthusiasts, and the just plain curious all along the route. What sort of trip have you guys had so far? What's it been like? Somewhere between fantastic and super. The cars belong to collectors who have saved them. Now redundant, motor cars used to carry maintenance men on the rails. Originally, uh, this machine didn't have these seats that you see. Oh, really? No, it had this uh, portion right here that covers the motor. It's called the doghouse, and uh, the workmen, when they went to uh, work out on the inspect the track and uh, work on switches and signals and stuff, they would just sit on here. Now they belong to these 35 visitors. The 21 motor cars are mostly from California and New York, 
and their owners love the Northwest. To me, in British Columbia, and I'm not being paid for this, are the best, friendliest people I've ever met in all my travels. And I've driven up here in a motorcycle and vehicles and motor cars, and I find the British Columbia people just wonderful. And the feeling is mutual. The Worsfold family got to travel to Prince Rupert with the motor cars, and they're recommending this form of sightseeing. Oh, I thought the scenery was nice, and it was kind of cool traveling in those cars. It's way better than traveling on the highway. <laughs> it was a great opportunity to go and, and meet with these people, and these are the best bunch of people that you'd ever want to travel with. It was interesting scenery, and they liked everything about being here. And they're just really fascinating people who have been around. It's great. There are some colorful characters in this bunch, like Rich Corbell, who hands out licorice or gives bubble-blowing lessons at stops along the way. And don't let this sign fool you. Just like the rest of the group, Todd Hill is a lot of fun. They're so friendly, they invited me to go along with them. <laughs> On the morning of my trip, it looks like rain, but everyone's in good spirits. The first order of business is a safety briefing from CN's John Armstrong. A lot of our traveling was uphill. A uh, few people underestimated their gas consumption, but that's a very minor detail from my view, of course. Today's section goes from Smithers to Burns Lake. I'm hitching a ride as far as the Houston lunch stop, suited up in a safety vest and CN hat to match the rest of the group. My duffel bag up front so you don't get your feet cold. I'm traveling in a car with Doug Jensen and Glenn Ford. This is Doug's car, but they're both motor car owners. Uh, Doug and I uh, have traveled several times together and uh, we've done it always in mind. And so uh, this time we decided to come, uh, uh, come in Doug's. Whose is more comfortable, yours or his? His, actually. These uh, seats with the armrests are very secure and very comfortable. We're on the thing for 10, 12 hours a day traveling. So uh, um, mine, you're, we're squirming around, our butts hurt more in mine than uh, can you say butts on Canadian television? And we're off, but not before picking up the day's trivia quiz. The group commended CN leader John Armstrong, who took special initiative to teach the visitors about the Northwest and Canada. See if you can answer these questions from our quiz. What is the bear that is unique to the North Coast? What day is Canada Day? What province is famous for exporting Christmas trees, blueberries, and lobster? Okay, I admit I gave them the first one. Doug has a GPS in his car, a global positioning system. It gives us information on distance and speed, and they converted it to kilometers just for this metric Canadian. We'll be traveling about 30 miles, 45 kilometers, an hour. <laughs> Cars travel through some areas that few people get to see. Other times, it's the road many see, but few have actually traveled. Here's Telqua from a different angle. The operators are especially cautious at road crossings. Down the line, it's time for our first break. These tours are a lot of work to put together. Organizer Tom Fair says this trip took about a year to plan and included a preview scouting trip. There's a strong attachment between some owners and cars, like Fred Furminger and the 303, built in 1943. So you put your hand like that, and if it kicks back, it'll throw your hand off. I didn't know the number of it when it was on the railroad, so I numbered it 303 after a steam engine that I used to fire when I was a kid. The engineer used to let me up there and fire it. I uh, had a train set as a kid, as all boys do. It's like a it's male like thing. I don't know. And, uh, and then I uh, always enjoyed, you know, trains and transportation kind of stuff. On this trip, Doug's car is having electrical gremlins. So the wipers don't always work, and he improvises to sound the horn. <laughs> but the most important parts are working. This is the 20 horsepower engine. The trip cost around $2,300 for two people, for hotel, food, and track fees. The group rents the track, and since the cars don't signal like trains do, they call ahead to get clearance for small sections, bit by bit, along the way. We've almost reached our lunch stop and the end of my tour. Here, and while starting, stopping, or crossing roads, operators use a flag system to communicate with each other. 
Is it? I live? Goes nowhere. All that traveling works up an appetite, and the tour works up the economy, using local hotels and caterers along the way. The event exposed a new kind of tourist to Northwest Towns, and it's an attraction for locals. It's good community spirit. We get lots of people out to come. Um, we advertised it quite a bit. They let us know ahead of time they were coming. So people came in for shopping, for just a variety of things. Um, just open the town up to something a little different. We don't have anything like that that comes through town. Well, I've been here, what, five times? If I could come up here every year, I would. And the Northwest would be happy to have them. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Registered professional planners are those who move beyond simply dreaming of inspired, sustainable, and diverse communities and choose to start building tangible, actionable plans to bring them to fruition. In this final segment of Home with Connection, let us return to the archives with Gwen Sewell. In the early 1950s, the natural wilderness of the northeast arm of the Douglas Channel suddenly awoke to large machines and the energy of men building a new aluminum plant. Three years later, the project evolved from construction to production, and in the meantime, Kitimat, the first new modern city of the 20th century, came into existence. At the very beginning of the 1950s, people thought Kitimat would be the third largest community in British Columbia. So after Vancouver and Victoria, the basic elements of our town's kind of attractiveness as, as an industrial setting, you know, the fact that we have a, a really excellent deep water harbor, it's ice-free, which is not unusual in terms of global sense, but in this northern latitude, reasonably unusual. Um, we have a lot of flat land where big industrial plants can locate. Alcan initiated Kitimat's development and built an industrial plant which remains as a basis of Kitimat's economy. From the very beginning, Alcan wanted a public town, not a company town, and continues to work towards attracting other industries to Kitimat. We were created to be a town that was designed to be a place that would be attractive for workers to come, work in industry, and raise their families. And at the time that our town was developed, it was kind of in vogue to do green belt cities. It's an idea that originated in the late 1800s in England, uh, according to that grew out of the Industrial Revolution. You wanted, as a factory owner, you wanted your workers to stay healthy. And that meant providing a little bit less crowded conditions than they had in industrial slums. So Ebenezer Howard was a fairly revolutionary factory owner and he decided that what he wanted to build for his city, his workers, is a greenbelt city. So he would surround his factories by park space and provide high quality housing for his employees. Kitimat is a product of design, planning and execution rather than accident and circumstance. It was built for its citizens and their future families. Kitimat's primary planning director, Clarence Stein, stated the town's purpose was to ensure the industrial success of the aluminum plant. Kitimat had to have qualities to attract workers and their families, but most important, Stein recognized it had to be good enough for families to want to make it their home. There was a big desire to keep children safe. So this town is a town for the motor range, and it's designed to make traffic flow calmly on residential streets and for children to have attractive play spaces. Um, in the older neighborhoods of Kitimat, you can see this quite clearly, the Chaco neighborhood specifically, where houses are oriented onto the green spaces at the rear of the house, not the street. So the street side is, is the back door. That's where you parked your car. That's maybe where you hung up your washing. And your front door was the door that faced towards the green space onto the pedestrian path. And so children, would play in the backyard or in the big green spaces that were maintained by the municipality. And you would watch for your neighbors arriving for coffee from that side of your house, not from the back door side. Because of course, the only automobile that your family was likely to own would have gone to the plant with your husband that morning. It's an amazing thing that that plus all of the aspects, all of the components of the Kitimat Kamano project uh, from the, uh, the Kenny Dam all the way to the tunnel and, and uh, the Kamano 
a powerhouse and a transmission line all the way to the smelter in the town. That was all done in five years. Kitimat's history is as important to its residents as the future is. The Kitimat Centennial Museum is creating a new permanent display which will be appropriately titled Kitimat City of Tomorrow and is expected to be open to the public in the middle of March 2002. I'm going through and working on uh, choosing photographs, images, uh, items from our archival collections and from our artifact collections and we're going to be telling the story of the Kitimat Kamano project and the more the, specifically the town of Kitimat. Paula Echeverria, the wife of an engineer who worked in Kitimat while it was being developed in the early 1950s, recently returned to reminisce. At that time, uh, we thought, and I, would th I think it's true today, uh, Kitimat Kimano are one of the engineering wonders of the world. We used to call it the eighth wonder of the world because to dam a river, to build a tunnel and funnel it through 10 miles and then drop the water 5,000 feet to generate power for a city of 50,000 uh, was very, very impressive. Today, Kitimat remains a marvel of nature and industry. The community boasts an unusually large multicultural population and environmental stewardship values run deep in both business and citizens. I have observed a genuine pride in the diversity of population here, the fact that people have come from all over Europe and Native Americans to live here. And people enjoy this enrichment. They, they consciously talk about an enrichment of the society. Although no growth spurt is expected in Kitimat anytime soon, past experience has taught everyone growth here can be rapid and very unpredictable. Because we are kind of globally connected or our interconnectivity to the global market, a lot of that growth potential is really up by Kitimat. And so the nature of our town is that we are competing with, we'll continue to compete for big industry. Um, and we compete for that big industry on a worldwide age. Up in the sky, was it a bird or a plane? No, it was a spirit. Bill Reed's magnificent sculpture, The Spirit of Haida Gwaii. Keep a comment, Run down. A crane was used to lower the bronze six-ton work into the Vancouver Museum's courtyard, where it goes on public display for the first time. It was unveiled last week at a gala tribute to renowned BC artist Bill Reed. Okay, put it down. Today's entrance wasn't as glamorous, but still attracted an appreciative crowd. Well done. Thank you. Appreciate it. Nice piece of artwork. Huh? Weighs six ton, 12,000 pounds. It's fine art. Yes, it is. Not just a piece of steel. Uh -huh. The sculpture will eventually end up in Vancouver's new airport terminal. After that, the spirit's flying days will be over. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Open Connection. The greatest distance in the existence of man is not from here to there, but the connection from his mind and heart. If we can conquer that distance, we can soar like an eagle and realize our immensity within. I'm Robert Pictone.